Hola a todos, eh, bienvenidos a una nueva sesión del de, eh, mes del diseño. En este caso, este día se trata de diseño y cultura, y en particular en este panel vamos a hablar del diseño y su valor cultural. Y para eso tenemos a unos estupendos invitados que prontamente eh, vamos a presentar. Primero que nada, quería comentarles que en esta ocasión, para quienes se hayan inscrito, eh, que ya tenemos 47, 48, la gente se está empezando a inscribir, tenemos por primera vez, y vamos a probar, eh, traducción simultánea vía Zoom. Por lo tanto, lo primero que les quiero decir es que para poder escuchar eh, la traducción de los panelistas que van a hablar en inglés, abajo en su pantalla deben tener un icono que tiene como un mundo o, o translation o algo así. Eh, ahí deben apretar y deben escuchar español. Y por ahí van a recibir la señal en español. Y cuando estemos hablando español no van a escuchar nada porque vamos a estar hablando español. Eh, así que cualquier pregunta que tengan la pueden hacer por el chat eh, eh, para resolver cualquier duda. Y si tienen tema con la traducción también los podemos guiar por ahí. Bueno, sin más eh, preámbulo, primero que va, quería presentar a Trinidad Guzmán, que es la coordinadora del área de diseño del Ministerio de Cultura, quien va a decir unas primeras palabras. Hola, buen día. Eh, bienvenidos a, a este nuevo panel sobre la cultura del diseño en esta novena versión de, del mes. Eh, estoy muy feliz y, y de verdad es un honor tener hoy día a, a Penny Spark y a Guy Juliet, dos teóricos de, de la historia del diseño, la comunicación, la identidad, que han sido una parte fundamental en la estructura y eh, la forma de programar las acciones y las políticas públicas desde el Ministerio de Cultura. Realmente es un honor. Eh, quisiera saludar a Nicole, quien es una historiadora del diseño, eh, investigadora, que está en Londres, quien va a moderar este panel. Eh, me gustaría recordar que, que nosotros comenzamos hace bastantes años eh, aquí en el área de diseño del Ministerio de la Cultura con seminarios de historia del diseño, los cuales fueron bastante exitosos. Nos, nos basamos en la historia del diseño general y entendiendo la historia del diseño chileno también. Pudimos celebrar el año pasado el centenario de la Bauhaus, su influencia aquí en Chile. Fuimos con una delegación a Alemania y hicimos algunos contactos con Penny y con, y con Guy para poder traerlos a Chile. Sin embargo, eh, los contextos sociales y, y, y este año ya el contexto de pandemia del COVID eh, no nos permitió tenerlos en formato presencial, pero sí los tenemos eh, de manera virtual, lo cual eh, es bastante honroso. Eh, y entendiendo que... que que el diseño es una disciplina que, que en el fondo está en un constante cambio y, y que el diseño es una disciplina que tiene dentro de su foco o, o más bien dentro de su objetivo principal el comunicar. Y ahí hay una cita que, que, que repito constantemente a mis estudiantes de, de, de Penny, eh, de su libro eh, El diseño y cultura, una introducción, que que tiene relación con que el diseño es capaz siempre de comunicar mensajes complejos mediante su lenguaje visual y material y mediante los valores y contenidos ideológicos que conlleva. En este sentido, los mensajes que el diseño quiere o ha querido comunicar muchas veces pueden ser malentendidos, poco precisos o modificados, pero resulta muy difícil ignorarlo. Es en este sentido que, que nosotros como diseñadores tenemos una responsabilidad social, política y cultural eh, en relación a los mensajes que nosotros vamos a comunicar y cómo lo estamos comunicando, entendiendo que estamos en un mundo bastante incierto en la manera en que nos relacionamos. Entonces, eh, eh, nada, yo quiero escuchar las reflexiones de, de, de Penny y de Guy en realidad en relación a esto eh, y así poder también tomar ciertos aspectos para ver la continuidad eh, de nuestros lineamientos a futuro. Así que, bienvenidos y, y, y gracias. Gracias, Trinidad. Nicole, dale nueva. 
Bueno, gracias Nicolás, gracias Trinidad por la introducción. Eh, aprovecho de dar la bienvenida a todas y todos que nos acompañan en este panel que hemos titulado El diseño y su valor cultural. Quiero agradecer antes que todo también a Penny Spart y a Guy Julier por acompañarnos. Eh, es un honor, como dijo, tenerlos acá con nosotros, eh, poder eh, por medio de sus reflexiones también iluminar y ayudarnos a pensar cómo podemos entender el rol del diseño hoy en un contexto de constante cambio, en un contexto que está requiriéndonos pensar en un mundo plural, en un contexto que nos ha requerido conllevar la incertidumbre. Entonces nos preguntamos cómo podemos entonces entender el rol del diseño hoy, cómo podemos entender la cultura del diseño hoy, cómo podemos acoger la flexibilidad, cómo podemos acoger los cambios políticos y sociales que estamos viviendo. Desde un Chile en medio de transformaciones estructurales, entonces nos preguntamos por ese rol del diseño, por esa cultura del diseño. Eh, o por esas culturas del diseño también, cómo podemos pensarlas, cómo podemos relacionar una cultura al diseño, o podemos también ampliamente pensar en las culturas del diseño. Antes de comenzar, me gustaría presentar eh, a Penny Spark y a Guy Julier, brevemente su trabajo. Penny es profesora de Historia del Diseño en Kingston University en Londres. Estudió literatura francesa en University of Sussex. Es doctor, doctora de Historia del Diseño por el Brighton Polytechnic, donde también enseñó Historia del Diseño, junto a otras universidades como Royal College of Arts. Penny ha pronunciado conferencias magistrales, curado exposiciones, y ha publicado ampliamente en torno al diseño, su historia y su cultura. Entre sus publicaciones se encuentran Diseño y Cultura, una introducción desde 1900 hasta la actualidad, The Plastic Age, The Modern Interior, Italian Design from Age 60s to the Present, As Long as It's Pink, entre otras. Eh, muchas gracias, Penny, por estar acá con nosotros. Eh, y sobre Guy Julier, Guy tiene más de 35 años de experiencia como educador e investigador en diseño y como diseñador. Vivió y trabajó en Leeds, donde se convirtió en profesor de diseño de la Leeds Metropolitan University. Durante este tiempo, fundó iniciativas como Design Leeds y Leeds Love It, Share It, centradas en la sustentabilidad y el desarrollo comunitario de la ciudad. Ha colaborado con Lucy Kimball en el desarrollo de prácticas de investigación en diseño social. Su libro más reciente, Economics of Design, proporciona un análisis de los múltiples roles del diseño en contextos neoliberales contemporáneos. Actualmente es jefe de investigación en el, en el Departamento de Diseño de Alto University. Muchas gracias a ambos, Penny y Guy, por estar con nosotros. Eh, y nada, eh, les dejo el micrófono y la pantalla para escucharlo. Comenzamos con Guy. Bueno, gracias por la invitación que está aquí. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'll continue in English from now. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, yes, it's a great pleasure and honor to be invited to take part in uh, this event. Um, I'll speak, uh, I'll try and keep this quite brief. Um, but I do have a tendency to talk on and on and on when I get going on uh, design. So uh, whilst I remembered to unmute myself, quite often I'm being told to mute myself. Um, anyway, I'll start. I mean, it's, um, so we're going to be talking about what is design culture today. Um, and uh, I want to give a slight historical dimension to it. I'm sure Penny Spark uh, will give... Uh, a fuller uh, uh, historical dimension to this uh, discussion. Um, but to start off with, I'm very pleased that we are talking about uh, design culture rather than design and culture. Because it seems to me that when we talk about design and culture, we are separating these spheres uh, from uh, one another and thinking about how design acts on culture and culture uh, acts on design, as if uh, design is not a cultural process uh, in itself. So by talking about design culture, um, we talk about more complex entanglements of cultural practices and what design is. And we can perhaps talk about um, a condition of design culture. And um, I hope it's not any, any too much of an exaggeration to Uh, suggest that we are actually living in an era of design culture. Um, that design culture itself has become a sort of commonplace 
um, concept and way of living, uh, particularly in the uh, global north and in, in the advanced industrial uh, world. Now, when we think about culture, of course, you know, we can think about culture in many ways. And I think uh, the uh, British uh, cultural uh, historian, uh, Raymond Williams, beautifully um, uh, expresses two levels of culture, one being that kind of historical dominant notion of culture of something to aspire to. So, you know, so we think of, you know, going to the opera or the theatre or uh, concerts as being some kind of form of cultural consumption. OK, and then there is the anthropological notion of uh, culture uh, as something uh, that we are all doing all the time. It is about the kind of ways of doing things, shared understandings and meanings in everyday uh, life. So in terms of design culture, I seem to get the sense that there are two, almost two design cultures going on within this larger notion of design culture. One is about an aspirational sense of design culture, about something to um, acquire or aim for. And I see that, you know, a few design consultancies these days you know, talk about one of the, the you know, uh, the um, services they offer to clients is to is engagement with uh, design culture, or in other words, that I suppose that um, overlaps a bit with design thinking, a kind of designerly way of knowing and uh, thinking. So something which is encultured, but also I think we can think about design culture as something we live in a, in our everyday life, something which becomes uh, commonplace. And if we think about design culture as something very much of the of contemporary world um, and something that is um, clearly um, relates to this, the rise of design over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. I mean, I looked at a report uh, just a few days ago uh, on the sort of global design business and it reported that um, global turnover in uh, design has risen 11.6% uh, every year since 2014. And that's a massive growth, um, if that figure is uh, correct. So it's about design becoming more commonplace in everyday life, just as in the 19th century, with the growth of uh, photography and various forms of urban planning and uh, of um, forms of uh, shopping through department stores, there's this growth of this, you know, of visuality. Now, I think we've gone beyond this era of visual culture, of the visual dominating our lives to this, uh, this period of design culture, if we're going to think about uh, um, uh, this sort of, these kinds of spheres, these kinds of ways of thinking. So, and I think this sociologist, Scott Lash, put this very, um, Clearly, uh, when he wrote uh, in a book in 2002, Critique of Information, um, he wrote, culture is three dimensional, as much tactile as visual or textual, all around us and inhabited, lived in rather than encountered in a separate realm of representation. So it seems to me that we are beyond representation. We are in this design sort of um, milieu, this design world, if you like, um, where we are encountering, encountering sort of cultural experiences in many different spheres, many, many, sorry, many different um, ways at the same time. Uh, you know, the tactile, the text, uh, textual, the spatial, um, and so on, and indeed the, the temporal. Okay, so um, let's think about a, a periodization. What do we mean? How long has this design culture thing been around for? Personally, um, I would um, argue that it's something very much of the last 30 uh, or 40 years where sort of design has really come to sort of dominate so many spheres of everyday life. Um, and uh, as we've just heard, I mean, I've been uh, increasingly interested in the relationship of economic practice and design and thinking about economic practice as a cultural activity uh, as well. Um, and I'd in fact go further to say that, you know, this era of design culture um, begins at least um, in some countries, in the United States, in um, Western Europe, in the 1980s. It unfolds in other places, 
with a shift from state controlled bureaucracies and state controlled markets and so on. So for example, in the, in the Soviet bloc after 1989, the dismantling of the Soviet bloc and this um, move towards marketized economies and capitalism and so on. So in, in, very, in brief, it is a, also about a, the rise of a particular form of capitalism. And maybe there are four ways of uh, thinking about this kind of capitalism. One is about uh, the growing deregulation of trade, uh, of credit, of banking systems, of um, uh, shareholding systems. It's about this new economy, a globalized distribution and production of uh, goods and indeed globalized consumption. It's about the dominance of this thing called financialization, which is about the dominance in the economy of uh, shareholders, investors, pension schemes, banks, but also assets like um, intellectual property and brands. And then for me, the fourth element in this historical period um, uh, is austerity, the growing uh, use of outsourcing for government um, functions, for welfare functions, for example, um, the, um, the, the weakening of state control over all kinds of mechanisms. In short, one might call this the period of neoliberalism. Okay, so I think that this design culture thing has been and continues at the moment to be a very neoliberal thing. If we think about uh, the kinds of uh, design that have come uh, about by these things like new economy, financialization, and so on, we think of you know, the growth of fast fashion, we think of intensities like shopping malls, creative quarters, uh, design centers, um, and indeed, we might even think of UX design, user experience design as being part of this kind of intensification of design culture. The growth of intellectual property and uh, the importance of that in corporate strategy. And I'll go even further to say that design culture has become a very embodied thing that the quantification of the, of the self, the use of you know, things like uh, smartphones, uh, tracking devices, um, and, and so on, has been about this uh, regime of counting and numbering and measurement, uh, which I think is very much uh, part of this neoliberal design culture. Okay, um, what about the future? We're going to talk, I guess, more about about uh, the future um, as we uh, get, get into the discussion. Um, however, I don't see massive change going on. We, you know, we're living this, um, this incredible pandemic at the moment, which we didn't foresee a year ago. Um, and obviously that is going to change things. It's going to open out new possibilities uh, and close down others. Um, but, uh, all those things I mentioned around neoliberalism and this form of capitalism that uh, we are living in, where I would say we're in this case, state of what some people call zombie capitalism, that so neoliberalism stumbles on like a sort of a half dead zombie, uh, despite these kind of massive uh, uh, challenges such as the COVID pandemic. But of course, we must talk about loss of biodiversity, the oppressive urbanization, the massification of information and uh, the growth of monopoly power, I think, which leads on to things like COVID, climate change, migration, inequalities, uh, and so on. So I think there's a lot of discussion and conversation to be had about um, where do we go from here? How do we, in fact, um, build a critical thinking around design culture as a way of understanding it so that we can then move forward and perhaps uh, make some fundamental uh, changes in the way we're organized, the way we, uh, we live, and indeed the kind of design uh, we do and the kind of design processes we undertake. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'm look, looking forward to listening to Penny Sparks um, reflections on this question. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Guy, por la presentación. Vamos a dejar la discusión y las preguntas para el final, para 
comentar, poder poner en común todo, así que dejamos ahora a Penny, Penny Stark. Um, hello, everybody. Pity I can't see you all, but I know you're all there. Um, like Guy, I'd like to thank you very, very much for inviting me to be involved in this incredibly interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to be saying some of the things he said and some of the things that he didn't say and not saying some of the things he said. So I think we, we, we said we're going to match, our talks are going to match quite well. And I'm approaching the brief for this discussion, the brief being what is design culture today and what does design mean in terms of this relationship with everyday life, which was the brief that was said. I'm approaching it as, as Guy suggested from the perspective of a historian, which I am, as I think it might help us to get a long view on it. And then I'll zoom in on the present to see if I can add anything useful, but I'm not gonna go as far as talk about the future, but as Guy said, we can address that in the discussion, hopefully. Now, historically, I think design's relationship with culture manifested itself in at least three ways and I'm very much in agreement with the kind of things Guy said before and they're going this is going to echo that. Firstly there's its relationship with culture with a small c which refers in the anthropological sense to its influence on everyday life. So that's the first way of thinking about design and I'm going to say design and culture for the moment but I'll, I'll say something about that later. Secondly, there's its relationship with culture with a big C, which um, Guy referred to as, as being described by Raymond Williams. Um, this refers to its role within high culture, that is alongside art, theater, opera, etc., where it has acted and continues to act on a meta level as a form of commentary on, and often resistance to, everyday life, politics, society, consumerism, etc. And then there's the notion of design culture itself, about which Guy spoke very eloquently, which refers to the way in which over time, design has evolved to become its own cultural messenger, inserting itself within the broader culture. Now over history, and history obviously is, <laughs> is long, I'm going to try and limit what I talk about rather quickly, but over history, at least the last two and three centuries, the three, have coexisted and I think there are probably more but they're the three key ones and they're quite hard to disentangle I think they 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 sort of work up against each other and they're hard to sort out but broadly speaking over those years let's say the last two centuries design has shifted its role many times positioned as it has been alongside several different agendas be those cultural political social economic technological etc in its modern incarnation, that is, as part of the programme of modernity, it emerged, design that is, within the mass production process in industrialising countries as part of the division of labour, displacing craft to a very significant extent. The cultural effect of this development was the transformation of people's lives through the availability of new goods through which they positioned themselves socially and which facilitated their everyday activities. That was very quickly joined by design's role within international trade and the defining part it played, and in some places indeed continues to play, within the emergence of national identities. And of course, it shouldn't be forgotten that it also played a very key role within colonialism, transferring Western capitalist values to many countries across the globe. So I'm talking now late 18th and through the 19th century. Ideologically, therefore, design emerged as an intrinsic component of Western economic capitalism, and it became a driver of the constricted consumption that was the, the other side of that coin of production. Manifested in commodities and commodified spaces and environments, it dominated everyday life in the industrialized and colonized world for many decades. Now that position was challenged, as we all know, in the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century by a program of design reform led by William Morris in the UK and the advent of modernism. Through the modernist challenge, design's cultural role took on its capital C and it began to perform a proactive role as an agent of change, or at least to be seen as having the potential to be an agent of change. 
At the same time, of course, on, on another level, design continued to accommodate and to a significant extent determine the everyday cultural values linked to the lives lived within a capitalist economy. So already we're getting different levels operating together. Now, the reforming role of design has remained a constant up to the present day, manifesting itself arguably through the radical and critical anti-design movements of the 1960s and 1970s. That agenda of radical design, design emerged like modernism before it as a response to design's absorption into and perpetration of the message of conspicuous consumption, which by the 1950s had in the industrialized world achieved new levels of strength. I'm going to jump into more recent times and, and deal really with the last of the three decades that Guy was talking about. The neoliberalist 1980s witnessed a new spike in the graph of design's messaging of conspicuous consumption in the industrialized world. And as a result, it became its own form of communication. I think that's saying the same kind of thing that Guy was saying about it becoming embedded rather than being something that stood alongside or, or um, had a kind of separate um, entity. The idea of design culture, which was consolidated in that decade, I believe, was expressed through the widespread use of the terms design and designer in the commercial context and the enhanced public awareness of them. Designers, people were led to believe, had the power to imbue goods and settings with magical qualities. Now, if we jump now to the early 21st century, which I think has built on that, the early 21st century has seen a significant growth in the public's awareness of the enormous challenges created by, and I'm going to give you a list now of all the challenges we face, um, threats to the environment, those presented by globalization, decolonization, social inequality and lack of inclusion, the rise of right-wing politics, digitization and dematerialization, issues related to identity formation and global pandemics, which brings us to where we are today. It's a long list, but there are, I think that there are others as well, but those are the kind of issues, if you like, that are focusing us. That has led once again to the idea that design should be given the power to change things and that it can challenge the status quo as well as represent it. As a result, I think the culture of design has been significantly transformed in these years, as have the cultural values it's represented. Now that shift in consciousness, and it's, I'm still being a historian, if you like, talking even about the present, that shift in consciousness gave rise to the emergence of today's highly diverse and fragmented design culture, which comes to be recognized by such descriptors as design thinking, sustainable design, service design, design for well-being, empathic design, interaction design, social design, universal design, design activism, co-design, participatory design, critical design, sorry, such a long list, design cultures, design anthropology, design writing, and global design history, and there are more. We're now in a very fragmented world where all these issues are being addressed, but we're finding little niche definitions of the way in which design culture is operating. These all function across academia and the commercial sector, transforming the requirements of the design curriculum and the practice of design. So this brings me back to today's brief. What is design culture today? And what does design mean in terms of its relationship with everyday life? The answer to the first, I think, is that today's design culture exists on a very broad spectrum from at one end, its role within luxury goods trades, the continue to drive global conspicuous consumption and inequality, to at the other, the fragmented picture of design resistance that I've just briefly outlined, and we can talk more about this, obviously. Design's relationship with commerce and late capitalism has not receded, but it's accompanied by a new awareness on the part of many designers and many others that where they can, they need to respond to today's challenges and very importantly, work in multidisciplinary teams, not work alone, but work with other disciplines. The result of this perhaps is that while the public is less aware of the contribution of design, and the names of designers to their lives than they have been here too, in the medium to long term, it stands to benefit from design's proactive engagement with the numerous challenges that face us all in the early 21st century. Thank you, I'll stop there and um, hopefully we'll have a, a good discussion coming out of that.
Muchas gracias Penny, muchas gracias Gai por las dos presentaciones increíbles que por lo demás muy contingentes que nos permiten pensar por un lado una imbricación muy profunda entre el diseño y el sistema neoliberal que es una discusión que también estamos teniendo en Chile en este momento justamente en medio de un movimiento social importante que ha tomado el neoliberalismo como una de las tantas banderas de lucha y por otro lado también eh, como postulaba Penny el poder pensar el diseño desde, esta, desde su manifestación en lo más cotidiano, ¿no? en, la, en, en la vida más, más ordinaria, ¿no? en, en estas capas que muchas veces ni siquiera se perciben como diseño, pero que ahí está, ¿no? y que están absolutamente incrustadas en la sociedad. Y que nos ha permitido pensar por medio de estas dos presentaciones relaciones económicas en el diseño, como hemos estado por medio del diseño muchas veces intensificando ¿no? este sistema, y por otro lado, como también proponía Penny, intentando también cambiarlo, ¿no? por medio de estos cambios de conciencia que empiezan a aparecer como parte también de la, diseño, del, de la cultura del diseño. Entonces, para un poco quizás abrir la discusión, me gustaría quizás preguntarles o profundizar un poco más en esta quizás doble o triple relación que podríamos ent entender en entre el diseño y la cultura, que podría ser, por un lado, okay, esta relación eh, en la vida cotidiana, ¿no? este diseño que ya se encuentra absolutamente incrustado, que ya es parte de, de una cierta estabilidad que nos acompaña en el día a día, pero también este motor del diseño como motor de cambio, ¿no? como motor de, como en esta capacidad de integrar estas nuevas conciencias que están apareciendo. Entonces, como hay una linealidad y un... un, un una línea del diseño que apunta hacia entonces ese cambio, mientras hay otra línea del diseño que también está apuntando a esta, en esta capa más de, de estabilidad, ¿no? de pasar estos cambios a la vida cotidiana, a esta, cuando casi no los percibimos, cómo funciona en esta doble relación, y lo que podría ser entonces una quizás triple relación, como postulaba también Guy, en esta intensificación del mismo sistema, en la reproducción del mismo sistema, y no solamente en postular este cambio de sistema. Entonces tenemos una capa del diseño no percibido, una capa del diseño como intensificador de este sistema, ¿no? y por otro lado el diseño como también un, pos un posible promovor, prom prom promovedor del cambio. Entonces me gustaría ver cómo ven ustedes que, que actúan, que se relacionan estas tres, estas tres o dos capas, no sé cómo las entienden ustedes, y también me preguntaba por la capacidad, la posibilidad del diseño de realmente dislocarse de, de su matriz, quizás, eh, en la cual ha sido construido durante, en esta perspectiva histórica eh, que los dos plantean, eh, para poder también imaginar estas nuevas posibilidades, ¿no? para poder pues, imaginar este, un futuro que quizás tome esta matriz, esta matriz que tal vez pensaba en palabras de Escobar, podría llamarse formación ontopistémica, ¿no? pero esta matriz de pensamiento, esta matriz económica en la cual el diseño ha sido desarrollado y las posibilidades concretas que tiene el diseño para, dentro de este sistema, tener la posibilidad de imaginar también otros futuros, ¿no? de imaginar eh, nuevas formas, eh, más allá de este sistema que los dos mencionaban desde una perspectiva vinculada al capitalismo y la industrialización y también desde el sistema neoliberal, en el caso de Gai. Eh, eso para partir... Y también invito a, a todos eh, quienes nos acompañan hoy a que puedan ir haciendo sus preguntas. Eh, tenemos ya una pequeña lista de preguntas, no tan pequeña en realidad, bastante extensa, pero tenemos ya una lista de preguntas previas que fueron mandando eh, algunos de los participantes que hoy nos acompañan, pero también que puedan ir eh, ahí en el link de preguntas y respuestas, que puedan ir compartiendo las inquietudes y las podemos ir acá eh, trayendo a la conversación. No sé, Penny y Guy, les dejo la palabra. Ok, so we're not in the same room. <laughs> we're not all the uh, same country. We can't make those sort of micro movements to uh, <laughs> show each other who we. Penny, do you want to uh, start though? I'll. Uh, Leave it to you to start if you like. <laughs> well, shall I start rambling and then we can just... Uh, I'll continue the rambling, yes. We'll take it from there. Um, that was a very long question. But I, th I think we were more or less saying the same kind of thing, really, that, that 
culture is a complicated thing, design is a complicated thing, and, and the way they either interact with or one embeds itself in the other is complicated as well. So I think there's no easy answers here. But I, I think also we've got to be careful that we make a separation between the sort of the design industry, if you want to call it that, um, which is designers, the industry, their industry, and the way they, they work and function with industry and society, you know, so manufacturing industry, service industry, or society and the public, because it, it, it works with all of those things. We need to make a separation from that and the way that it's shifting and moving in response to challenges. And the way design as a kind of a phenomenon, as, 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 a, as a result of this process of design, impacts on us in our everyday life as in the visual, material, spatial world. And I think, don't let's confuse those because it's, well, I, I, I don't have a brain that can work with them in this, both together. They're, they're, they're rather different, but they touch, obviously, through the, through the language of the word design. Does that mean, mean anything to you, Guy? Does that? I, I think so. I mean, I, um... The question of design indu uh, industries uh, in your presentation, which I really enjoyed, uh, you talked about you finished with this incredibly amazing long list <laughs> of uh, <laughs> uh, different uh, design specialisms. And um, I was looking at the American Institute of Graphic Artists website last week, and you know they report like twenty three specialisms, you know, within the gra uh, within graphic art or graphic communication, uh, indeed. Yeah. And I think that is, um, I, I personally, I, I've, um, can we separate this sort of design industry from how it's felt in, in everyday life? I'm not sure. I feel that the design industry, part of the, the um, reason for this constant fragmentation and spinning out of new specialisms really comes down to the way in which design has never been normative in terms of you know its education its professional expectations and so on so you know most countries you train to be an architect and you have to pass certain exams usually set by the uh, professional organization of whatever country you are in and so on with, uh, to get this certificate so to practice as a an architect um uh, and so on you know it's, it's much more held by normative processes whereas design has never had that mm. and design has been always designers have always been very light on their feet to reinvent themselves mm -hmm. you know and so in moments of i always think that in moments of um recession of austerity they're extremely good at doing that uh, as well you look at po moments in history the 1930s the 1970s the periods of economic recession and that's where and in the 19, early 1990s that's when new specialisms have spun out of design even more so i mean for me that is therefore says something also about design culture as being never static that it's in a constant state of emergence, just in the same way that the prod many of the products you know we now buy and have and use in everyday life are you know subject to, for example, constant upgrades. You know, with your phones and your computers and this sort of thing, they're constantly sort of unfinished objects, really. And you know, it's partly to do with the networks that they are part of. And I think this is another issue we might think about and talk about with design culture, that it's no longer about, you know, uh, individual objects. We, you know, no object is an island in design culture. They are all networked into, into particular uh, process. I mean, a really simple um, uh, version would be, you know, your iPhone, you know, you need computers, you need electricity, you need software, you know, uh, Apple shops and God knows what. Um, yeah, so th there's that, and then there's corporate power, you know, trying to control this, you know, kaleidoscope of, you know, of the stuff opening and, you know, uh, constantly opening and emerging and changing at the same time. So, um, you know, what the big corporate design world has been very good at is, in fact, sort of holding down that process of change, in a sense, for their kind of, um, you know, for the sake of their show shareholders, mostly, uh, you know, for their market dominance, really. Um, I mean, again, to come back to Scott Lash, who I mentioned earlier, um, I and mean, he talks about neoliberalism as being about the, the competition of monopolies, 
Okay, so, you know, um, uh, so large corporations hold monopolies, be it McDonald's or, or Burger King or Samsung or, or Apple, you know, hold monopolies over particular kinds of systems and constantly in competition with each other for control over those uh, monopolies. So, um, so yeah, it, it's complex. I think another thing in Nicole's question maybe about this thing though, about holding different positions at the same time and how we deal with that. Um, you know, so, um, you know, I know plenty of professional designers who are doing, you know, sort of fairly straightforward capitalistic type of work by day, you know, branding and uh, corporate identity or product engineering or whatever. And by night they're doing, uh, you know, so sort of community engagement programs and social design and, uh, yeah, and so on, which is, has a very different kind of set of publics and different sets of engagements and processes uh, and so on. And so, you know, it's also designers themselves working in different levels with different kind of motivations and so on. And sometimes it's, you know, hard to, uh, hold that but um that is you know um i think uh the geographer paul chatterton wrote about this 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 you know we in the capitalist world we have to also live our contradictions yeah yeah no that, i think everything you said is absolutely right i mean i, I suppose one of the, the sort of simple ways to move forward is is to sort of to move away from the kind of corporate um, world that you're talking about and the way that things are clamped down by those kind of vested interests is and to try and bring designers into whole people rather than having to work do one thing the day one thing at night is to just to think about the, the clients they're working for and to, to work much more with the health sector with education you know to sort of change the sort of nature of the work and change the nature of the of the client but of course that's you know financially driven and not so easy to imagine I sat right idealistic to say but I do get a sense that that's happening more that yeah um, those kind of clients are, are understanding yeah. the role that designers can play but not necessarily as visualized but maybe as design thinkers and the like yeah, yeah um you know integrating design back in the process really um problem, problem solving again more of the term but back in the process of bringing about change they don't might not be designing the new hospital beds but they might be thinking about new meter circulation of around the wards i don't know but so i think that's part of it as well that there's a trying to bring those two things together so you, you're not the zones aren't schizophrenic which I'm, yeah I'm yeah, yeah. Have to be to yeah. yeah and i think it's about not just thinking in terms of structural change uh but i mean you mentioned the anti-designers of the mm. 60s and 70s I mean, they were profoundly interested in structural change but they also appreciated um design as an or design culture as an embodied mm -hmm. thing that it, yeah. you know that we through our relationship to objects and uh, how we use objects and uh, that our, our objects also shape us. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Donna Haraway's sort of uh, psych, yeah. uh, kind of cyborgian notion, I guess. Um, you know, and that we that the objects which are designed also involve an element of disciplining, of internalization, of certain ways of being and acting in the world, you know, so I mentioned quantification and measurement uh, um, earlier uh, this afternoon. Um, so it's about thinking about that as well. I was talking with a, um, a designer in Barcelona last week. Uh, well, I wasn't in Barcelona, we were on Zoom, um, but uh, talk, and he's talking about how his uh, design consultancy, you know, think about their bodies a lot these days. You know, how, how, how do they feel in their bodies? you know, in terms of the work they're doing, or how do their clients feel in their bodies, and this sort of thing. So, so to bring it back to that very kind of very personal, uh, routine, uh, felt sort of level, I think is can be quite productive. Because, because also there's a lot of undoing we have to do as well. <laughs> sure, sure. Can I just apologise for my audio being low? I've seen a couple of messages. I'll try and shout, but I'm afraid I can't do much about it. There's a lot of I hope you can hear me enough. Yeah. No, no hay problema, Penny. Se, efectivamente se escucha un poco entrecortado, okay. pero vamos a entender la idea, así que está perfecto. Um, y bueno, quería también poner un punto en relación a cómo opera el diseño, o recalcarlo más bien. 
eh, en el ámbito de la micropolítica, a fin de cuentas, cuando hablamos de, de lo íntimo, de la cotidianidad, ¿no? de, de este mundo que, material que nos está acompañando en el día a día, que pasa desde el cuerpo a los objetos que nos rodean, y también en este entretejido con las macropolíticas, también, ¿verdad? el sistema económico, las instituciones, y cómo entonces esta cultura del diseño se gesta en estas diferentes capas, ¿no? en esta complejidad que, que involucra un montón de... Eh, un montón de niveles que operan en diferentes dimensiones, pero todos igual de importantes, ¿no? que pasan, como decían, desde el mismo cuerpo hasta, hasta capas mucho más eh, macro, ¿no? que, que escapan de nuestra, tal vez, eh, escala más individual. Solamente para eh, eh, recalcarlo. Quería tomar una de las preguntas eh, que enviaron uno de los participantes, eh, que creo que justamente se vincula con lo que estamos recién conversando. Y preguntan, eh, pregunta, ¿cómo potenciar el valor cultural del diseño en una sociedad mediada por la tecnología y ontologías que se vinculan a la nueva era, considerando que muchos aún mantienen y creen que el diseño solo genera un valor económico? ¿De qué manera el diseño podría potenciar el valor cultural que tiene a nivel sistémico en una sociedad. Entonces, pienso que aquí la pregunta está separando un poco el valor económico del valor cultural, cosa que yo veo de manera más junta, también como estamos conversando acá, y más entretejida. Pero lo que me parece interesante es que la pregunta está planteando cómo podemos entonces en un mundo tan fuertemente mediado por este relato del progreso vinculado a la tecnología, cómo podemos entonces eh, ampliar las posibilidades de entender eh, el valor cultural, más allá de esta mediación que tiene una agencia al mediar. Entonces no, no está en esa mediación enfocando a, a mirar en esa línea. Básicamente traer la tecnología a la conversación. I want to just start on that one. I'll pick up. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Um, how can we um, and for me, this is about the way we, the ways by which we talk and represent design. Um, and I think, you know, just as the ways in which design can be uh, done has fragmented and grown and so on, so have the ways by which we can represent and to, to talk and discuss and value design. Um, so, um, so I, I mean, going back, I mean, Penny and I have known each other for a very long time, several decades. And, you know, when we first knew each other back in the 80s, I mean, I think, Penny, you'd agree that the fora, the, the places where you could, for example, publish stuff about design and the audiences for design were fairly restricted. Mm -hmm. You know, you were, um, it was what we call, you know, coffee table books, mostly um, uh, a few design magazines uh, and so on. You know, and these days we have, you know, so many forums, such as this forum we're talking in uh, now. You know, I was involved with the Design Museum in London, which was apparently the first world, the world's first design museum, if you don't count the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, you know, and since then, were well, there's something like over 40 design museums, at least in Europe alone, you know? Um, so the platforms and the places where design can be uh, discussed and the levels at which design can be discussed and the ways by which design can be discussed has grown uh, enormously in the last um, 10, 20 years or so. And this is exponential and it is extraordinarily uh, welcome. Um, so um, in terms of the kind of thinking about the sort of cultural role of um, design, it's also about the, the kind of ways of culturally expressing design, a framing of thinking about it as, as articulating de design, um, are sort of multi-layered uh, as well. Um, I'm sort of trying to avoid talking about technology there. So, <laughs> <laughs> shall, I, shall I just pick up on the, the yes. difference between economics and culture, or, yeah, yeah. or are they different? Um, mm. I think I think they can work in tandem. I don't think it's one or the other. I 
think it's more about thinking about the short term and the long term. Um, and designers, I think, particularly through design education, but also most designers with any kind of conscience are thinking much longer term now. So that if they're not designing just things, they're designing things which then move into a life cycle and can be, um, you know, whatever, they can be taken apart, they can be reused, recycled, upcycled, back into the, the system, waste system and out again. So it, it, in a sense, you know, we, can, we don't have to have a sort of pa set of parallel systems, I don't think. We just need to think in longer term. And I think that's what design is doing. And designers are very often educating um, manufacturers or clients about those sorts of issues. So I think design does play a proactive role in, in encouraging that longer. So the economic and the cultural don't necessarily have to take different routes. They, they, can, they can work together. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, um, I mean, one of the things I've noticed another question about um, you know, making change through consumption and changing consumption patterns and so on, um, which I think relates to this in, in a way. Um, and for me, I think thinking about the consumption end of things is, is basically too late. It's, um, you know, retrofitting uh, something, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's actually trying to look at sort of changes which are incredibly, take an incredible amount of time uh, to enact, okay? Because, you know, our everyday consumption processes, way we live, the, uh, and also the ways in which we are tied into certain consumption uh, processes, um, you know, it's so deep that it just takes us, takes decades probably to climb out of these. Um, and I mean, I have a colleague who's written a, a big report on this thing called 1.5 degree lifestyles. So um, if we're going to keep within um, uh, planetary warming level of more than 1.5%, you know, it requires massive changes of consumption levels as well, the way we travel, the way we eat, um, our power, energy consumption levels, and so on, just to keep to 1.5, which is still a massive change in global temperatures and so on. Um, so I don't think we can look at it from in terms of, uh, you know, as, a, as designers, how do, how do we change consumption pat patterns? It's also got to be thinking about the, you know, the other parts of, um, of what we might call the circuit of culture, the way in which sort of ideas and practices circulate through production, representation, uh, you know, um, through um, regulation uh, as well. And this is why, for example, uh, it was mentioned earlier, this thing about, you know, the, the growth of design in policymaking. Uh, which is a really good way uh, by, by which we can begin to imagine in more interesting ways so that policies, for example, <coughs> don't end up just as a report and a set of statute books and this sort of thing. They can actually be modelled and um, you know, re, you know, created in some way to sort of you know, test them out, indeed. Um, I've written a note in my, to myself about, um, yeah, I think it's in response to what uh, Penny was talking about, of uh, opening up, you know, the time frame in which designers might think. And I think <clears throat> this is also then about opening up the imagination and creating new models and what I like to call prefiguration as well. This idea of, you know, you actually create a, a, um, a living lab of a new form of politics or a new form of economics, okay? And you test those out and you prove their um, you know, uh, proof, proof of concept, if you like. We've got lots of questions. Zoe. Yeah, I saw a question come up there about, I didn't read the full thing. Could you interpret, Nicole? Perhaps we're not looking at the same ones. I thought I saw the word feminism flash up on a question, but it went away quickly. Maybe not. Do you think we ought to address this question of technology, Guy? <laughs> I mean, for me, it's a very simple thing. Technology is a tool and we control it. And um, well, just about. Um, and so we, you know, the, the cultural values are what matter. And if the if technology is made to serve the ends of the cultural values, we we value, then you know that's it. But I know, I know that's a very simplistic answer. But well, I, I, yeah, I mean to continue with that. I mean, 
It's also about how we talk about technology and indeed lots of these things like innovation as well. Um, <clears throat> there's a tendency amongst technocrats to think about or talk about technology and innovation as if they were sort of separate things uh, in everyday life, that they were divorced from <clears throat> the way we live, from culture, from politics and so on. And it's really important to think about, well, what kind of innovation are we talking about? Innovation for who and at what level or what kind of technologies and how are our um, expectations of technology culturally formed as well? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think many of us have lived through this kind of, uh, those of us who were born in the 60s, you know, remember the great, the great white heat of technology and uh, this idea of, you know, this sort of science fiction version, which, you know, allies with a lot with modernism as well, this kind of bright utopian uh, future uh, within which technology is very central. Um, but we also know that that is the kind of language of certain despotisms as well. The question, sorry, Nicole, this is your job. It was about feminism and minority struggles. Ah. It was for you, Penny. Yeah, I, I can't see it, I'm afraid. Let me try and find it. it Pe I'll, I'll read it out. Penny, you do you, I'll go on. Penny, do you think design from now to forward has to be taught and practiced as an ally to feminism and minority struggles? Well, that, I mean, that's a really important and hugely important question. When I gave my great long list of all the challenges we have, um, which I'm sure you won't have remembered because I zipped through them very quickly, one of them I mentioned was issues related to identity, for, identity formation. I use that term very widely to cover um, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, uh, etc. And also the important challenge of social inequality and lack of inclusion. And I, I think these, I think we've got different kinds of challenges. It's interesting how the challenges cluster around different kinds of things. There's the big ones, there's the environmental ones and the climate ones, which affect us all, and they just have to be sorted, hopefully. Um, and then there's the one that affects us into, as individuals and, and, you know, culture affects us in that broad generic sense and in the individual sense. And I think it's important to, that those have to be considered together. And I do think those, those challenges of gender, sexual in, uh, equality and inequality have not been resolved. And design, like everything else, has to, has to incorporate them, absolutely, and address them. I think one of the things here that um, designers are very good at is just taking that leap of faith um, and trying sort of things out in a way, um, mm -hmm. thinking about what would this look like? What would it feel like? Um, what kind of relationships would this involve and, and, mm -hmm. and so on? So these things are like, you know, minorities and feminism and so on, they, they provide very good um, perspectives and tools and, and um, places to sort of explore and become in a sense pathfinders. Um, so, I mean, for example, you know, here's at Alto Design Department, we have, you know, doctoral students from like one from Mexico looking at sort of, you know, feminist uh, uh, activist spaces in Mexico, for example. You know, we've got work, work on, you know, what would a degrowth economy look like? And um, so we've got stuff on what an eco state uh, would, eco welfare state and so on. So this is where, you know, a space which is perhaps more exploratory, is perhaps less commercial as a space, but nonetheless, mm -hmm is important, um, where designers are really good at asking these kind of big questions, but also taking them the questions down to think about, well, what does this mean materially? Mm -hmm. What does this mean in terms of cultural experience and, and so on? Yeah, and this is where, um, you know, as a historian stop and the future all this just starts, but that's what designers do. They imagine the future and once they've defined the issue, the problem, the challenge, then their role is, is, is to think their way through it and to think their way through it imaginatively and creatively and um, perhaps not in the most, you know, sort of linear, logical way that other, other thinkers might do, but to, to go around it in different ways. And you know, I, I love the idea of prototyping as being a way of thinking, of just trying things out and testing them. And that's what designers do. And that's why they're so important to, to the culture in the broader sense. Um, 
Voy a tomar otra de las preguntas que aparecen aquí de parte de los participantes, uniéndola un poco con, con la idea de integrar estas otras subjetividades, esta otra sensibilidad. Es necesario integrar el diseño y darles un rol central, como es también como la crítica feminista. Eh, me gustaría, perdón, voy a apagar mi traducción porque creo que es el caso. Eh, entonces, me gustaría preguntar, si bien desde el actores, eh, agentes, eh, desde el activismo, se han empezado a integrar ¿no? estas nuevas voces, estos nuevos eh, reclamos que también han ido expandiendo las fronteras del diseño, ¿no? Por la integración de estos nuevos actores. ¿Cuál es el rol, más allá de estos... Eh, de esta capa desde el activismo, ¿no? desde las bases, en el fondo, ¿cuál podría ser el rol también de las instituciones dentro de esta formación? Y eso lo tomo porque también preguntan cuál podría ser eventualmente el rol de un centro de diseño o de un museo del diseño. Eh, y ahí por eso es que quería pescar un poco el lugar de las instituciones en conformar esta cultura del diseño polifónica, amplia y plural, donde se integren estas otras subjetividades, ¿no? como lo es también la feminista. Y la voz de la mujer, en términos más amplios. I'm not sure that translated into a question I fully understood. Did, Guy, did you get that? Yeah, sure. Maybe I can try to... That will be yeah. 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 Um, so, I am thinking in which is the place of the institutions to can integrate, like in the... Um, like in a polyphonic uh, culture of design, because often we, when we are, when we talk about like um, other subjectivities uh, involved in the design, we often relate that with activism, no? Like with the small groups, like from the from the organ independence uh, organizations. But which is the role of the institutions to kind of integrate at the same time? like a polyphonic boy culture of design. Um, from the participants, they ask about the possibilities they're relevant to have, for example, a center of design or a museum of design. Um, so for that reason, I am trying to put in the conversation, the role of the institution in the frame mm -hmm. of, a, of a, like, a plural culture of design. Are we thinking about particular kinds of institutions or, or generally? Sorry, Ben? Okay, I mean, if we, for the time being, think about uh, things like decorative arts museums and design museums and, and so on, just to start off with. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think their role has changed quite a bit. Um, well, the role of many of them have changed uh, quite a bit in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. Um, I think many design museums, for example, uh, when they were founded, either emerged from being decorative art, arts museums um, and at the start were continuing that kind of line of being repositories and showcases for, you know, good design, capital G, capital D, I suppose. Um, and as a, as a tool for the promotion of design, Uh, in industry and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I think in most, no, I, I don't know about most countries. I mean, I, I, plenty of, the, there's some reason to think that uh, that we're now beyond that now, that, you know, the, the sort of um, uh, using the museum as a promotion tool, um, it, you know, they still have a role there, but they can, they're, they're doing other things as well these days. Um, so they are acting as places of discussion and representation of um, the role of design as material culture or the role of design as culture of, cu of culture in everyday uh, life. So the, the objects might have shifted, not entirely. I mean, I think mu design museology has been, you know, for a very long time focused on pretty much aesthetic appeal. And um, many muse design museums are opening the doors, if you like, to much more thinking about, you know, what is interesting, what's powerful, what's significant about these objects. 
Um, I mean, I didn't put this in my biography because it's too takes too long to write down, but I was a research fellow in the Victoria and Albert Museum for about six or seven years before I came to Finland. And even in that time, in the two, early two, no, 2010 onwards, there was a, a shift towards new patterns of collecting. So there was this idea of collecting um, objects for the museum, which were culturally and historically significant rather than just beautiful necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it changes the question of aesthetics, I guess. <coughs> um, and now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, for example, you know, whilst they've been partially closed down during the pandemic, they produce this fabulous blog called um, Pandemic Objects, mm -hmm. where they talk about the significance of things like dance moves or elastics, elasticity, or things like that. Um, as a way of sort of opening up kind of questions, I guess. And those questions themselves are sort of provocative and they engage conversation and have, let's call it an activist edge to them as well, because they are also about um, uh, describing things. And by describing things, I think, you, you know, the de description is a political act, I think. Saying what is there, you know, and how it's there uh, and so on, kind of opens up the uh, things for analysis. Yeah, you're right that cultural institutions particularly are, are having to review their their agenda, I suppose. I mean, I'm currently trying to, with, with some colleagues, curate an exhibition for an upcoming Biennale, which is, is about the notion of home and it's stimulated by the way in which the home has become in such an important space within, within COVID, within coronavirus. Mm. And it's made us think very hard about the kind of things we might want to show in this exhibition. And um, there are very few objects, actually. We end up wanting to show films and videos and, and having performances take place. And in a sense, that there is a kind of death of the object. Uh, objects are still important, but they're, they're not on their own anymore. And it, it is actually quite challenging for people who are used to curating or um, putting collections together in museums because it, it, it's not just a question of objects on plinths, it's very, very much not that. And then there's the question of how you, if you're going to show a film in an exhibition, how do you make people flow around the exhibition and they can stop and watch film all the time? How, how do you actually um, get the messages across? It's, it's quite hard if you haven't got a nice pretty object sitting there that everybody thinks that looks nice. It's a whole different engagement with the audience. And I think institutions are beginning to have to think about those kind of questions. Yes, I mean, I curated the Finnish pavilion for the Trinale di Milano uh, two years ago. And uh, we got advice from, you know, well-known museum curators who said, told us, you must have a, a captivating object at the yeah. entrance to your exhibition. So we decided not to do that. And we just decided to try and tell stories of projects, yeah. uh, which is extraordinarily difficult in a way. It is difficult, it's more difficult. It takes more invention yeah. and imagination yeah. to do that, but it's important. But it does it does throw a spanner in the works of the conventional role of, of um, those kind of exhibitions and collections in, in museums. Muchas gracias. Y para ser más concreta con la pregunta de, que nos hacían del participante en relación al, al Museo del Diseño, eh, en su experiencia, eh, porque en Reino Unido existe un Museo del Diseño, eh, ¿cuál ha sido la relevancia en poder promover una cultura del diseño? Eh, ¿Cuál ha sido la relevancia del museo, eh, de la existencia de este centro, de este espacio, en poder promover de manera más transversal, en abrir al público más allá de las de la disciplina más, desde el lugar más académico, eh, el diseño eh, dentro de Reino Unido, tomándolo como una referencia que acá en Chile por el momento no, no tenemos este lugar. If you need, I can do it in English. I don't know if, if you have the idea. Well, I, I, I think, sorry. Is Nicole speaking? No, no just yeah. checking if you, if you got it from the translation. Yes, it, it was it was clear. Um, yeah, so you have the challenge in Chile of if you had a music design museum, what would it be? And I think in many ways you're thinking about it at exactly the right time because you're not encumbered and you know buried under the, the kind of traditional expectations that Guy was talking about of 
having to promote the message of good design and that absolutely would not be what you would want to do um who knows what good design is anymore if it, you know if everything's good design if you look at it from a certain angle i think it's a much more exciting challenge to be able to think about how do we communicate the meanings and the tensions and the kind of questions that are raised by what design culture is 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 all about at the moment um and i think you need to sort of give yourself a very clear brief which addresses that kind of question and then think well what would that mean you need to do and it may not be a walk around exhibition it may be something entirely different but a very interesting challenge i think mm. It might be not to have a museum at all. It might be that you don't have it that you don't use the word museum. You might just completely yeah, sidestep it and think differently. But it's I mean, a I mean, very interesting challenge. I mean, I think in cultural policy making, there it does tend to be a kind of global um, fear of missing out. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if one place has a Biennale, another place has to yep. have a Biennale uh, and so on. And I mean, I remember uh, there's a curator called Jan Bolin, a uh, Belgian curator, who was curator of the, the Ljubljana Biennale uh, for a few years, and he tried to make the fifth Biennale the last one to say, mm -hmm. you know, that is enough Biennales. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Ljubljana was saying, no, no, we still want to get, we, we need to keep going and so on. And so you end up sort of exhausting this, this uh, model, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And closing down opportunities for thinking of uh, other ways of doing it. Yeah. Yes, I do think that if you look back over the way the design message, the design phenomenon has, has spread around the world, it, 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 there has been this sort of repetition of let's have a design museum, let's have a biennale, let's have this. And maybe they're, they're worn out, maybe they are. And, and I think the benefit of starting again, I think, actually is, 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 is exciting. Mm -hmm. Gracias. Eh, me gustaría ahora traer a la conversación una pregunta que hace Claudia. Eh, considerando que el sistema neoliberal está en cuestionamiento por su visión poco solidaria que perpetúa las injusticias sociales y considerando que la economía debería ser un medio y no un fin para un bien común, ¿cómo se sitúa la cultura del diseño siendo parte de esta contradicción? ¿Cómo el diseño puede retroalimentarse y ser parte de otros modelos? Nicole, perhaps you could help us with that a little bit. Sorry, uh, Penny? Could, could you help us with putting that into some other words for us, maybe? Yeah, sure. So considering that the um, uh, neoliberal system mm -hmm. uh, um, is being challenged, is being questioned uh, or disputed for its vision like an uh, individualistic system. Mm -hmm. So Claudia is asking um, that she is like noting that there is like a contradiction um, in between that the design, this, uh, in, in between a system that is looking for like a, a common, um, how I can say, it? Bien mm. común. let me check. Um, yeah. Like, let me check the question. So it is uh, concerning that the, so Claudia is putting like how we can, uh, considering that we have like an individualistic system uh, because of the neoliber neoliberalism system, how uh, design can uh, be, has like a feedback from other models to can uh, being at the same time part of the system, part of it. So it's how we can uh, put in our system, other systems. Yeah. At the same time, being part of this system. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I've I'm, got. That. I'm translating, but yeah. Thank you. Go <laughs> go thank you very much for the question. It's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think. Um, I think uh, it might be useful to think. I seem to have our translation going at the same time, which is excellent. Um, I, I think it's it, it might be useful to think. Uh, in terms of, for example, in terms of economies rather than economy, singular, um, just in the same way that we talked about sort of design in be, 
being very fragmented and multiple and so on, um, that when we begin to think about uh, that possibility that there are multiple ways of um, of economic, multiple economic practices that can take place um, and that um, not all economies are necessarily financial economies as well. So there's things like care economies, um, you know, where, you know, looking after people, uh, for example, you know, relatives, children and, uh, and so on, or each other um, is a form of economy because it's a form of transaction, a form of exchange, um, which is socially binding as well. Um, so uh, if we begin to think of economies as being multiple, and there are multiple ways of doing uh, economies and then begin to think about, well, yes, what is special? What is interesting? What is supportive? What is common uh, in some of these other forms of economies? Then we can begin to let's provide routes to thinking about how we might uh, work alongside them as uh, designers. Um, and I think another thing is here um, that uh, I think that uh, orthodox sort of business school uh, positions on the economy tend to think of it, the economy as being about the commercial sphere. Um, and if any of you are big fans like me of uh, Mariana Mazzucato's work uh, and her book, The Entrepreneurial State and her latest book, uh, The Value of Everything. Um, you know, she talks about this idea that actually, um, you know, the public sector, for example, has been incredibly important uh, as a place for innovation and new technologies. And we wouldn't have our iPhones without universities, you know, for new materials to be developed in. And so they are part of the economy uh, as well. You know, so when people ask me, you know, talk about you know, getting our design students ready for the, the real world, I kind of think, well, what is the real world? We are actually creating the real world here. Uh, in any case, and you know, it says there's an entanglement, I guess, of these these things. Um, so I guess um, my long ramble here is really about sort of thinking in more complex terms mm. about how economics and design um, kind of unfold and entangle, and so on. Mm -hmm. and on a slightly different tangent, less about economics, but more about the way designers. Um, need to engage with things not on an individualistic basis, which which was which came through that um, mm. question as well, is, is that I think designers are very keen now to engage with other disciplines and, and, and to sort of just be part of multidisciplinary teams. And I see that on, on, in many different ways. And social science obviously is a hugely important partner to, to um, a lot of design. Um, projects because they start further back and they start much further back in the process and they need the work coming from social scientists but also from visual economists and I'm, I'm working a lot um, on the role of actually nature and plants in, in a designing context and you can't do that without mm. environmental psychologists and horticulturalists and mm. other people so I, I think design is, is has understood finally it's not a very it's not an individualistic profession anymore and yeah. therefore it's not dealing with people in quite the same way it's thinking in a much more holistic um horizontal way about yeah. how things need to be addressed and that's i think that's important and i think thinking about what we do have rather than what we don't have so we mentioned earlier about you know the the fear of missing out of not having a design museum or biennale mm. or whatever i mean a really good example i heard the other day was about how i mean denmark as a country owns a huge amount of patents for wind power, for wind turbines. And that goes back to the 1970s when um, there was a very strong anti-nuclear movement in Denmark. Um, and so there was no nuclear power in Denmark. And so people uh, already wanted to defossilize their economies and began to play around and hack and make wind turbines. And through this, developed all kinds of mechanisms and things which got patented and this sort of thing. And this is why Denmark now is covered in wind turbines and, mm. and say holds lots of the intellectual property. So it's a question of, you know, working with what you've got, mm. yeah. um, you know, rather than sort of, you know, following what you think you should have. Yeah. 
aprovecho entonces complementar con otra pregunta que envía Rodrigo, y él propone, ¿será necesario en esta nueva etapa de la humanidad y el diseño la recuperación, por ejemplo, de los metarrelatos en los que conocíamos el movimiento, con el movimiento moderno, una nueva perspectiva colectiva respecto a nuestro mañana, nuestro entorno y nuestra sociedad? Nicole, can you just rephrase that for us, maybe? A little. Yeah, sure. So, Rodrigo is asking about um, how, if it, is, uh, if it is necessary in this new age of the humanity and design to come back to some like um, big uh, narratives. Right. Um, that, we, that we had during the modern movement. Um, historically, like in terms of design architecture, um, he's asking uh, about like the collective perspective and mm -hmm. how we, um, um, how we, if it is necessary maybe to come back to this collective frame, uh, ut utopia ideology that design has during the 20th century, no, and how we can put it in or use it uh, today. Mm. I think that's a really interesting question and you know, I do try as a historian to stand back and sort of see patterns and shapes in the way things have changed and moved and I, I do think we're in a kind of near modern phase actually um, that we do have to think collectively about the climate of, climate obviously but also coronavirus and everything else it's no good you can't go it alone you have to we have to the whole world has to work together on this and I think that is a grand narrative and I think it, you know modernism set out to democratize the world. I think, you know, the equivalent, we do need to think about, you know, sort of solving the, plan, the problem of the planet in a, in a similar kind of way. Obviously there are different means and there is a different moment and there's a different set of priorities, and et cetera, et cetera. But that collectivity, I think is an important feature of today. Yes, I, I mean, I agree. I, I would like to see that collectivity, the, a sense of it being more balanced um, you know, I mean, obviously me sitting here in Finland and uh, Penny in London uh, and so on, perhaps, uh, you know, we're in danger of you know, feeding this, you know, west, you know, yeah. global north to global south, you know, process and, and so on. Um, you know, I guess we need uh, Arturo Escobar to uh, walk into the room and tell us about the need for mm -hmm. a of us, uh, really, and a more balanced, I think, uh, narrative, I guess. Of sure. Y para, bueno, nos quedan todavía los últimos minutos, así que vamos a integrar las últimas preguntas. Eh, me gustaría preguntar también por eh, el rol de la educación. Eh, ¿Qué conexión, uh -huh. qué relaciones eh, pueden ver ustedes entre el diseño y la educación en esta creación de, la cultura, de una cultura del diseño más amplia y más inclusiva? It's yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, design, obviously, there's a there's a very, very strong global design education system. I think it's it has hit a bit of a crisis in the sense that it it's been it's a bit, bit like a dinosaur. It's been quite slow to turn around and address what's happening. I mean, some where guy is obviously they've been doing it for some years, but a, a lot of the British education systems are, are only just waking up to the fact that it has to be done differently. I, I go back to this notion of multidisciplinarity, and I think um alliances with with other disciplines in, in in universities for example need to be made whether that be with health health um faculties or scientific faculties or, or whatever engineering faculties that, that designers are very well placed to understand how they work how to work in a team and i think that's something they can bring to the to other aspects of the university and and join up so i think it, we have to think very differently about how we do education but i think that you know, there's, there's a wonderful baseline there to work on. Yes, um, I, um, I think to some degree, uh, design academia has been quite shy about taking part in other mm. fora outside design. So you don't see many designers at geography concert, um, conferences or sociology conferences or health mm -hmm. conferences 
uh, whatever. And, you know, I think that, you know, we're on the edges of that. Um, you know, I feel this is something which is emergent and is beginning to happen and so on. Um, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm very pleased when technology experts or science and policy experts come to our department for a symposium and they say, um, oh, it's really surprising to hear these conversations going on in a design department. We thought you just made things look nice. And, um, you know, so I think this sort of sophistication of design um, exploration, experimentation um, and articulation and research and so on um, is sort of, it's mature enough, I think, now mm -hmm. for these conversations, these complex interdisciplinary um, uh, conversations to, uh, to take place. And I'd also say that, um, that we might think about, let's call it design culture studies, as a cross-disciplinary mm -hmm. kind of practice where we actually move beyond kind of traditional disciplinary boundaries and we begin to think about sort of new ways of talking about things, new theories, new, new ontologies even, new ways of feeling things and knowing things as well and use that as a kind of uh, exploratory process and space. Mm. And I agree that designers need, it does in, the, in academia need more confidence because they, they can do that, they can lead those discussions, but I don't know that they know they can sometimes. Yeah. Muchas gracias. Creo que con esta pregunta estamos lamentablemente llegando al final de nuestra conversación, pero creo que hemos podido eh, pasar por los diferentes temas eh, que queríamos tocar con ustedes. Eh, ha sido una instancia eh, increíble poder nada, eh, pensar en conjunto eh, cómo entendemos el rol del diseño hoy, cómo integramos nuevas voces, cómo integramos nuestras nuevas crisis, ¿no? Eh, Gracias por, por compartirnos sus reflexiones, por compartirnos sus experiencias. Eh, las valoramos profundamente eh, y su trabajo ha sido un gran aporte para nosotros acá. Sí, yo quería agregar también, eh, well, thank you very much, uh, both of you, y muchas gracias por, por este gran panel. Solo quería eh, notar y quedarme con, con la idea de esta, de frente a la pregunta de diseñar hoy, esta idea que ambos eh, dijeron, ¿no? que la cultura del diseño está, cambia, o va aparejada del sistema de valores que lo sostiene, y que si bien hoy ese sistema de valores está asociado a un, a un modelo económico que está, en, que está en cuestión, que está en desarrollo su cambio, uno podría pensar de que la, la nueva cultura del diseño va a estar también aparejada a un nuevo sistema de valores por emerger o por construir. Y me gustó mucho eso que, que se planteó de que, que si bien el diseño está relacionado a la economía, hay muchas formas de hacer economía y ahí profesor Escobar, que fue invitado a este mes del diseño, lamentablemente tenía muchos compromisos eh, y ya lo tendremos en el futuro para conversar sobre esto, eh, pero me quedo con esa idea de las economías y de las economías creativas y en ese sentido muchas formas de ejercer economía puede ir asociado a muchas formas de ejercer diseño, tratando también de intentar eh, develar como un nuevo sistema de valores, eh, digamos que acompañará, por decirlo así, la construcción de la cultura del diseño del futuro. Quería mencionar eso porque es algo que estamos pensando muy, muy, muy profundamente, creo, mucha gente en, en nuestro país, respecto de cómo vincular eh, diseño con cultura y economía. Y los quiero dejar invitados a próximamente en otras actividades que vamos a ir haciendo en esta línea de cara al, a este desafío grande que tenemos que es crear eh, políticas de diseño eh, de largo plazo. Así que muchas gracias por, por eso, espero que se haya entendido lo que, lo que dije. Y solo dejar invitada a la audiencia que ahora, en media hora más, eh, vamos a tener un nuevo panel donde vamos a lanzar la vitrina del diseño chileno, eh, que son alrededor de 50 exponentes eh, que han sido seleccionados por eh, Chile Local, eh, la Feria Impresionante y Chile Diseño, eh, básicamente para tener un panorama de qué, de qué se está haciendo en Chile, cómo se responde la pregunta de qué es diseñar hoy, desde la práctica, y vamos a tener un entretenido panel moderado por, por Trinidad Guzmán, y ahí eh, está el link de Zoom en el chat del nuevo, y también el link de la vitrina para que puedan pinchar ahí y mantenerse conectados en este, eh, en este segundo panel. Bueno, eso es, muchísimas gracias por todo, muy interesante panel, y bueno, estamos en contacto. Muchas gracias, gracias a todos quienes nos Thank escucharon. You.
Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.